I'd like to share something about insulin that you probably have never heard before. And this is extremely uh, revealing because most people are sitting on a confusion relating to insulin. They don't even know it's a confusion. And then at the end of this, everything is going to make total sense. There's a lot of great truths that you can figure out uh, by looking in a subject that involves paradoxes and conflicting information. And in this area, there's some conflicting information um, that we need to sort out. So conflicting information is where you have uh, fact A conflict with fact B, right? You can't have two facts that conflict, right? One of them is not a fact. So when you get these conflicting facts, uh, you just have to go deeper and just figure out what is going on. But then you usually can find some really interesting information. Let's talk about this in relationship to insulin. The main reason why keto works, okay, for so many problems and intermittent fasting is the benefits of reducing your insulin. So anytime you reduce your insulin, you get all these amazing benefits. And so there's even books on uh, hyperinsulinemia, which is a state where you have this high insulin in the blood. So even if someone's a type one diabetic, they uh, have to take a lot of insulin. And of course, the more they take, the worse things are for their health, right? I mean, the idea would be to take the minimal amount. But if we go through the function of insulin, okay, most people do know that insulin lowers your blood sugar. That's a good thing. Other people might know that insulin helps your muscles grow. Okay, it has an anabolic effect on your muscles. And this is why even certain um, bodybuilders might take insulin or consume carbs to increase their insulin so they can develop their muscles. But if insulin is so bad or so dangerous in high amounts, why does it help you with your muscles? Okay, that sounds like a real positive thing. Well, when you start looking into the other uh, purposes or functions of insulin, you find some fascinating, fascinating information. You may have seen where I talk about people using insulin spray to spray insulin up their sinuses into this barrier that goes into their brain to help uh, dementia. Wow, that's interesting because I thought like type three diabetes is considered Alzheimer's and the more insulin the worse off you are for your brain and your cognitive function, right? But why would they use this nasal insulin spray to improve the symptoms of dementia? Also, insulin is anti-atherogenic. It means that insulin is actually supportive for your arteries. Hmm, interesting. Because we hear so much about how insulin destroys your arteries, contributing to the placking and clotting and calcification and heart disease. Now, this is another thing that's very interesting. And I, I, you probably need to be sitting down to hear this. Insulin actually lowers your LDL, the so-called bad cholesterol. Now that's totally conflicting of what most people know, that too much insulin increases the bad cholesterol LDL, especially the small dense particle size, which is very pathogenic. To your arteries. Now, here's another one. Insulin is a vasodilator and it helps to lower your blood pressure. Yes, it's totally true. Look, go ahead and look it up. But what about this thing called metabolic syndrome where you have um, high blood pressure, you have high LDL, and you're pre-diabetic? How can that be? Here's another one. Insulin actually lowers the production of glucose in your liver. It's called gluconeogenesis. So in other words, insulin reduces gluconeogenesis, the formation of new sugar in the liver. Now, what about all these people who are diabetics or pre-diabetics that wake up in the morning with dawn phenomena where they have high blood glucose, but they have not eaten any carbs the day before they had no sugar. Where's that sugar coming from? Well, the liver's making it. Well, insulin inhibits that process. Now, I already mentioned this thing with muscles. So insulin helps you um, develop and grow new muscles. It also prevents the breakdown of muscle, protecting against muscle atrophy. All right, but why do people with high levels of insulin, like hyperinsulinemia, have a very high incidence of muscle atrophy? Fascinating. All right, here's another one. Insulin helps you absorb potassium and magnesium. Yeah. But how can that be if 
people with high levels of insulin in the blood, hyperinsulinemia, have a deficiency of potassium and a deficiency of magnesium. I mean, it's even correlated with the more insulin you have, the less potassium you're going to have, the less magnesium you're going to have in your body. Here's another one that's interesting. This involves the adipose tissue. There's a term called lipolysis. And this basically is a term to describe the breakdown of lipids or fats. And insulin suppresses lipolysis, which is the breakdown of fat. So it preserves adipose tissue for a survival mechanism. It prevents the release of this fat. But what's interesting with people that have a lot of insulin in their blood, they have an aberrated dysfunctional suppression of this lipolysis. It's not that they're going to start losing weight, at least initially, but they will lose fatty acids from the fat cells that end up in the arteries, okay? Creating high levels of blood fats or lipids, okay? And yes, I'm talking about triglycerides and yes, I'm talking about cholesterol and LDL. So again, we have another conflict of these so-called facts. All right, here's another fascinating one. Insulin is a potent anti-inflammatory. Wow. I mean, this completely goes against what so many people have been taught that insulin creates more inflammation, like in a diabetic where they have all this insulin in their bodies, type two, for example, they're just filled with inflammation, right? How can that be? I'll get to that point in about 30 seconds, okay? Just one last point I wanna bring up about this is that insulin is also uh, an antioxidant. It has antioxidant properties, completely the opposite of what occurs when people have all this insulin in the bloodstream. They have oxidation, free radical damage. They have these, these massive complications from diabetes. So it's another conflicting piece of information. I mean, just go ahead and look up the symptoms of hyperinsulinemia. That's too much insulin in the blood. You'll see higher risk for sleep apnea. You'll see lower testosterone. When in fact, insulin actually normally is supposed to increase testosterone. You also see high levels of uric acid. Well, did you know that insulin is supposed to help you lower uric acid? Interesting. And you also see a release or excretion of potassium with um, uh, high levels of insulin, but insulin is supposed to actually preserve or retain potassium. So what the heck is going on here? Okay. Well, here's the piece of information that will make everything make sense. And it has to do with the control of insulin. You have the pancreas, the beta cells that make insulin, and it's sent through the body. And uh, then it goes through the blood and then it gets connected to an insulin receptor. It's the receptor that sends back information, the cells that make uh, insulin that tell that cell how much to make or how little to make. So really the brain of this whole communication feedback loop is the receptor. And when that receptor becomes resistant as an in insulin resistance, then we no longer have the function of that hormone. The function of insulin can only exist if the receptor is receiving that insulin correctly, and then it tells the body what to do. In insulin resistance, we actually have an insulin deficiency. We have an insulin lack. And all those negative things I've just talked about relating to insulin relate to a deficiency of insulin, not an excess. Yes, you may have an excess of insulin in your blood, but it's not affecting the receptor. So really in diabetes, in all these other conditions, what we're really dealing with is a deficiency problem. Now, knowing that allows everything to make sense. When I went back and forth between the function of insulin and the problems or conflicting information of, of insulin, really we're talking about sufficient insulin versus a lack of insulin, but it's all coming from that insulin resistance. Okay. That's the problem. Now, knowing that information will then focus your attention on how do we fix insulin resistance? Well, it's high levels of insulin that creates the resistance, okay? So the more that you increase that hormone, the less the receptor is going to work. The more carbs that you eat, the more insulin resistance you're going to have. It's the frequency of eating, okay, that creates insulin resistance. It's also excessive amount of protein can do it because this excessive amount of protein turns into sugar. But then we also have other things too that can 
create a worsening effect of this receptor. Uh, insomnia, um, stress, cortisol, like a lot of cortisol, uh, certain medications like uh, prednisone, which is cortisol, but stress is a big one. Also trans fats, also omega-6 oils, like all the ones that create inflammation. And then inflammation in general will create this insulin resistance. So how do we fix this problem? We get on the healthy version of the ketogenic diet. We do intermittent fasting. Okay, those two things are gonna be the big things. And just so you know, um, like a type one diabetic, right? They're taking roughly 40 to 80 units of fast acting insulin a day with about 25 to 30 units of the slow acting insulin every single day. That's a tremendous amount of insulin. And insulin is not cheap. It's very, very expensive. Well, at least in America. Now I did a video of someone recently who was a type one diabetic who was dependent on this insulin. And after they went on the ketogenic diet and did intermittent fasting, they only had to take two to five units of the fast acting insulin. That's two to five units. That's compared to the 40 to 80 units that they were taking before. I mean, that's an incredible drop in the need for insulin, especially since the more insulin you take, the more resistance that you create. Are there other things you can do to speed up the process to re reduce this resistance in the insulin receptor? The answer is yes. Regular exercise, extremely beneficial. And of course, the obvious, reduce your stress, um, get more sleep. But apple cider vinegar in a regular basis, like a tablespoon uh, in your water can be very beneficial for blood sugars and insulin. Berberine is a really good herb that has been known to help with this situation. Also cinnamon, put a little cinnamon on your, your toast and I'm just being sarcastic, but cinnamon is good. Also chromium is really good. Zinc is really beneficial. Vitamin D is very beneficial. Magnesium is really good. Potassium will also help. And omega-3 fatty acids will also help. And just so you know, the only two things that won't increase insulin are fat and fiber. This is why large salads are going to be very beneficial in your plan, as well as increasing the fat okay, in your diet, which won't trigger insulin too much. In fact, there's a insulin index that I talk about that the more fat that protein comes with, the lesser effect on the insulin versus the lean proteins. Lean proteins are not good for insulin. So I hope everything makes sense now and just to keep it simple, but I think the next most important video for you to watch would be on this insulin index thing. Very interesting. That way you can learn about the foods um, to eat and the foods to avoid. And I put that up right here.